So hello everyone for the on the our weekly quantum information quantum computation seminar. So today our guest is uh, Luis Masanes from University College London. So uh, let me say a few words about Luis. So Luis did his PhD in 2004 at the University of Barcelona. Well, he's originally Catalonian. Catalonian. Then he has held uh, several postdoctoral positions. For instance, at ICFO in Barcelona or at the University of Cambridge. And now he's a professor at, the, uh, at UCL in London, but he lives in Cambridge. And uh, let me also say that he, uh, he has been working on many various uh, fields. Well, they are related, but uh, different. So, so he started from, from standard quantum information, let's say. Then he was working on fundamentals of quantum theory and quantum thermodynamics. And he has also obtained very interesting, uh, many very interesting results, such as new axiomatizations of quantum theory. And today he will tell us whether causal dynamics imply local interactions. OK, so Luis, the microphone. Thanks, Remik. Thanks, Remik. Yeah, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I, so this, I'm going to talk about whether, whether causal dynamics imply local interactions. Maybe at this point, this, this is not clear. But let me, let me just introduce what I'm going to talk about. OK, so here you can see that so what I'm going to present is based on these three papers. Uh, the third still is not in the archive. Uh, and it's joint work with all these authors, OK? Lots of people from many different places as well. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a type of many body system, which is called quantum cellular automata, OK? Quantum, so let me introduce in case some of you are, are not familiar. A quantum cellular automata is a, is a quantum system in a discrete space time. So you can think of a, as a spin chain, for instance, that would be in one dimension, in one spatial dimension. But um, you can also have it in three or four or any, any number of sp spatial dimensions. But the important thing is that not only space is discrete, but time is also discrete. OK. Uh, the dynamics is in general um, homogeneous. This means that it is translation invariant, but translations in, in space and translations in time. Okay, so it's basically the, well, let me just say the final, the final condition is causal. Causal means that if I perform a perturbation, um, one second, if I perturb a perturbation here, Okay, I'm, I'm writing in the... Do you see my, my pen writing? I, I, I can see it, but I'm not sure whether people have recognized that you started to write. Maybe I'll put it thicker. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so imagine they put a perturbation here. So at future time steps, this perturbation is only acting uh, on neighboring spins, okay? This is time zero, this is time one, this is time two, and in time two, it only acts this, spins, and it has not changed the outside of the light cone, okay? So causal means that the dynamics is restricted to a light cone, okay? That information travels at a finite speed, okay? So basically, this is the same as, a, as what we think of a spin chain with a... Hamiltonian having local interactions, okay? The only difference is that in a Hamiltonian, uh, time is continuous. And in a Hamiltonian, the causality is approximate. So Lee Robinson bounds tell us that uh, Hamiltonians, if the Hamiltonian is with a bounded range interactions, the light cone, there will be a, an approximate light cone, but this uh, operator will also evolve outside of the light cone with exponentially decaying probability amplitude, OK? So it's, it's approximately causal. And here is exactly causal. And we can do that because space-time is discrete. OK. Sorry, um, can, I, uh, can I ask something? Yes, please? sure. Uh, so do you ask, let's say, is this dynamics sort of deterministic? Uh, in a sense, like, like I, I imagine that you can put some, land, let's say, local random channels or random gates, or like you define a better uh, like, is it like at the, on every time step you put the same, let's say, yeah. you, you so, apply the same uh, evolution? 
Yes, the same evolution, exactly. It's not like what people call random circuits. Okay. okay, okay. So this is deterministic, is unitary. Okay, so maybe I should I should write here that uh, is unitary. Maybe I forgot to put this condition. Okay. Good. Later we will see some examples. Okay, so this is what we are going to talk about today. So it's like a it's like a quantum field theory in discrete space time, basically. Okay. Okay, so uh, I need sorry to... to to add a little joke. So it's one can also say it's just some uh, deterministic uh, local uh, uh, quantum circuit, <laughs> right? Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. This is, this is what I what I'm saying now. Uh, it's a deterministic local circuit, um, like this one, for example. But it, that's not the most general cellular automata. Not all cellular automata can be written as a as a circuit with local gates, as a quantum circuit, okay? So this, but yeah, maybe the most usual one is what we have now here. And here we can also see that a circuit with local gates. So if this is our initial perturbation, the, the effect of our perturbation will have a strict light cone, okay? It, it, because the gates are local, it never goes out of this light cone, okay? Uh, so yeah, quantum circuits with local gates are the most normal QCA, but not the only one. Okay, uh, we were also going to see a quantum cellular automata with disorder, okay? And this is because we, we want to get rid of the fact that we, we don't want the system to be translational invariant, okay? We have to want to model a system with disorder, okay? But again, connecting to what Michal said, this doesn't mean that um, this situation, okay? So, um, let me... so this this system has disorder in space, okay? Because every different color means that the gate, that the unitary, that the two side unitary is different. But you see that it is also disorder in in time, this circuit, okay? So this is what people call uh, quantum circuits, and we are not going to consider those, okay? So. Uh, we are not considering this situation. We are considering this situation where we choose some random gates in the first two layers, and later we repeat them again and again and again. Okay. So the topic of quantum uh, random circuits has been studied a lot. Okay. Like people study anti concentration, unitary designs, many things. Okay. And actually, it's, it's much simpler to analyze this thing because every gate only appears one, okay? So th there are no correlations in time. Well, here, this is a random gate, but it appears again and again, and it's more difficult to analyze because it's like a polynomial of the gate, what we, are, what we so have. Just to, just to uh, uh, understand, so it's a, uh, by, by random, you mean that your model is that in the beginning of evolution, you pick those gates in two layers at random, and then you iterate this evolution and mm -hmm. so this is, and you study, let's say, uh, yeah, maybe, okay, it's, it's random, but fixed throughout the evolution. Exactly. It's okay. random in the okay. same sense of people, people don't matter when they study um, disorder or axons localization is the same, is the same type of randomness. Okay. It's, it's like, it doesn't mean that it is, so randomness is just a mathematical way of modeling the system, but it's not random. If you have a, a solid that is not crystalline, the Hamiltonian is fixed. It's not that it is random, okay? But it's just that you model it by random because it's, you, know, you don't know the exact configuration. And actually, it doesn't matter which configuration. You just want a typical configuration, okay? But yeah, it's still deterministic, still unitary, okay? And here, uh, we will see that in some QCAs with disorder, you have um, localization. We will see later. So this is actually a real a real simulation. So uh, this is a, a spin chain here. Every pixel is a qubit and the different colors stand. So white means the identity and blue, red, and yellow means uh, sigma X, sigma Z, and sigma Y. Okay, so we start with a sigma Z here and this QCA will evolve to different, to, to um, so it, it's clearly a, a clear for unitary because it maps 
Paulis to Paulis, not to linear combinations of Paulis. So we can do, we can write such a nice diagram. And if the system is disordered, first we see that this is quite uh, ergodic. There is not seems to be any pattern here, but eventually the system finds the, the operator grows in the Heisenberg picture and it finds a wall, okay? And it, it stay in the region forever, absolutely forever. And the interesting thing is that these walls are um, one-sided, okay? So this operator that grows from the left uh, reaches the wall and it cannot cross the wall, but another operator growing to the right direction will be able to cross the wall, okay? So they are, we call it one-sided walls, okay? This is the type of, um, the type of, this always appears when you have a CLE4 QCA with this order, okay, in one dimension. Later, I'll, I'll talk more about these things. Now I'm just introducing the, the whole topic of QCAs. Uh, one, okay, so this is our-, sorry, can, our I, time. can I ask, sorry, because it's- Sure, I sure. To ask, like, you, you are allowed, you're allowed, yes. It's good that you uh, ask. Also, I mean, also I encourage, you know, students to ask, because like- Sure. Um, I want, in what okay what well, okay I, I mathematically and let's say physically i got what, what you were saying but like in what sense this is the anderson localization so this is maybe yeah like this this um, previous figure in what sense it was showing anderson localization. okay so yeah maybe maybe i should not call it anderson's localization but just localization so the localization can be defined in several in different ways but one way is that the operator growth of an, the operator growth is just gets stuck, okay? Mm -hmm. or, or sometimes uh, they grow very slowly, like logarith as a logarithm of the time, okay? But here we get mm -hmm. a, a strong sense, okay? Uh, uh, in a strong sure. sense, in the sense that it, it, the, the light cone doesn't grow, okay? Uh, so it's in this sense, okay? okay. Uh, thanks, and so, okay, thank you. Um, now we can, the, the, the central question that we will address that has the title of the talk is that, yeah, so um, this um, QCA that it is written with, uh, let, let's suppose that these are qubits, these guys are qubits, and we have all these unitaries that are the same two qubit unitary. So now the, the um, well, when you have a system that evolves in discrete time, the dynamics is not characterized by a Hamiltonian, okay? Hamiltonians are to describe continuous time. The dynamics is characterized by a unitary, which is the evolution operator in a single time step, okay? So these two layers form a single time step because one layer could not be a time step because then it would not be time invariant, okay? Because this step is not exactly the same as this, okay? You have to do two steps and now the other two two layers and the other two layers is exactly the same. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is the central object in the QCA, okay? Defines the dynamics, dynamics that has to be trans, uh, translation invariant, time invariant and causal and unitary. And this is a unitary, okay? Um, but you know that any unitary can be written as the exponential of some Hamiltonian. But this is not unique because now if I take some of the eigenvalues of this Hamiltonian, okay, and I, I, I take one eigenvalue and I add two pi, the Hamiltonian has changed, has changed really a lot. Maybe now it's not local or whatever, but the unitary is still the same, okay? So, but yeah, so the Hamiltonian is not unique, but the question that we are going to ask is whether, um, there is one Hamiltonian among the many that is in some sense local, okay? So this is the first question that we are going to address. Yeah, is one of the Hamiltonians local? Now I just want to make a comment that if you allow time dependent Hamiltonians, like something like this, okay? Um, something like this, uh, then you can do them that they are local, okay? They, 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 are, they can be just first neighbors Hamiltonians in, in this case, okay? Because there is first neighbors gates. 
But we are not, so in this case, the answer would be yes. You can always find a local Hamiltonian that generates your causal unitary. But we are not interested in this. We want this, okay? So this is our first question. So this is a summary of the results that I'm going to present. I'm going to show that all, one second, all one dimensional quasi free fermion QCAs have a quasi local Hamiltonian. But I will also provide an instance of QCA in which all Hamiltonians are highly non local. Okay, so this already, this second point already answers our question. Okay, there, there is a counter example to the hypothesis. So, so this QCA, this instance, although is a causal dynamics, a causal unitary, any Hamiltonian that generates this unitary is highly non local. Okay, later I'm going to talk about QCH with disorder, and we will see that those are have a very mixing dynamics. I will specify what this means, and that uh, in another regime, they display Anderson localization, which is what I mentioned before. So these are two opposite regimes. And at the end, um, we will discuss whether Clifford dynamics should be regarded as integrable, chaotic, or, or something in between. OK. Well, questions? I ask can I ask? Sorry. Sure, it's sure. Very, yeah. It's very interesting. Just, I, okay, uh, what, uh, maybe I missed the definition of quasi, what you mean by quasi local? Uh, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm being vague now. I'm okay. being vague okay. now, and later we will, we will see. I just want to say sure. local in, in the broadest sense. So maybe the interactions decay slowly or whatever. Okay. Okay. Just the second, uh, second question, uh, just high level, like you, you mentioned that the, 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 the most, general cellular automata are not quantum cellular automata, they are not just concatenations of unitaries. Mm -hmm. So uh, what they are then like just, or like generally? I don't know, just a big unitary that um, that uh, is causal. So one, one example, one example could be the following. Imagine that you have a spin chain and you consider a unitary that takes your state and shifts it one qubit to the right all the spin chain shifts it one so imagine you have uh uh how you call it boundary conditions uh close boundary conditions and you just do this okay mm -hmm. this is a qca it, it satisfies all the definition of qca but it cannot be written as a circuit so this could be a, a simple counter example uh, so it cannot be written as a circuit in this locality let's say or is that, uh, yeah. that's that's okay Okay, thanks. Okay, so let's go with quasi-free fermions. Okay, so um, here you, you already have the, the answer of, of what I'm going to, to ask, but let's um, show everything. Okay, so what is a quasi-free fermion QCA? Well, is a, so because it's fermion, you have these Majorana operators, or if you want, you could consider the creation and annihilation operators. And when you apply in the Heisenberg picture the, the evolution operator to one of these fermionic operators, you get a linear combination of fermionic operators. Okay. This is very particular. So, in general, in a, if W is not quasi free, you will have a, a polynomial of, of A's. Okay. You will have some linear terms, some quadratic terms, AJ, AK, and three order terms. and, and yeah, you need the whole algebra of those generated by those, not only with linear combinations, but also with products. Okay. So this is very particular. So now we are going to consider this type of QCA. Now you can show that any Hamiltonian that generates this such unitary can be written as you expect as a, uh, as a quadratic uh, form with respect to the fermionic operators. Okay where the index i and j are locations in the lattice, okay? Now we want to ask uh, how this coefficient, so this, this is the more general Hamiltonian, and in general, this is not local, okay? Because it couples all i's and all j's. So we want to see how they, these coefficients decay with the distance. And we are going to show that if the unitary is causal, so we have a QCA, 
the coefficients decay exponential when the system is non-critical and algebraically when the system is critical. Now I'm going to define what means critical and non-critical. But at, this, at the end, we can see that in some sense, both cases are local, okay? So the second case is not very local, but uh, it's still in some sense local, okay? Because, you know, the interactions decay. Uh, decay slowly and in, in the, here it decay, they decay very fast. Okay, so let us see more clearly how these QCAs work. Uh, when you have a quasi-free fermion QCA, uh, the way to, let's say, diagonalize it is the same as when you have a quasi-free fermion Hamiltonian, okay? So it's basically a single particle problem. And at the end, you just find the, um, the relation between for every type, so you have you can have more than one type of particle, or maybe I should call them quasi-particle. And for each type of quasi-particle, you have an energy band, okay, that relates the quasi-momentum. It's called quasi because space is discrete, so the momentum is defined modulo 2 pi. Okay, so this is the quasi-momentum. And uh, for every quasi, given an energy band, at, which is like a species of particle, of quasi-particle, every quasi-momentum has associated a value of energy, okay? And the thing is with QCAs, this is not energy. This is quasi-energy, which means that is also defined modulo 2 pi, because as I said before, uh, unitaries, the eigenvalues of a unitary are defined modulo 2 pi. It, do it doesn't make sense to talk about absolute terms. For instance, in a unitary, you cannot talk in general about the ground state, okay? There is no ground states in unitaries, and in general, there is no ground states in QCAs. So, yeah, so then this is also, for instance, 2 pi is the same as zero in terms of quasi-energy, okay? So this example here is example of a non-critical system, okay? So, uh, it, you can prove that energy bands always need to be periodic in momentum. Look at this one, for instance, goes until here and it continues here and it then comes back to the original value of the energy, okay? So you, we see that if you do two loops here, you recover the same value of the energy, so it's periodic. This is clearly also periodic. And this one is also, you also need to steps to make it periodic. Okay, so this is um, non-critical. And what is critical then? Critical happens when uh, you have an energy band that does something like this. Imagine that it starts at zero, or let's suppose it starts here. Okay, so this energy band is continuous because its value is the same as this value. Maybe I'll, I'll do it in a color. But it has what people in topology call a non-trivial winding number. The winding number of this band is one because you cannot contract it to a straight line, okay? It, 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 it goes around the torus. This is, this is a torus, the, quasi, the diagram of quasi-energy versus quasi-momentum. And, you know, um, this red band is different than the others in the sense that it, it has a non-trivial winding number. All the others have zero winding number, okay? So when, when this, what this implies, the physics of this is that the quasi-particle associated to this band will have a constant, the states will have a constant velocity, okay? They will keep going. So in a way they cannot stop. And we, we call it critical because it's like, it's like massless particles. Massless particles can only go at the speed of light. They cannot go faster, but they cannot go slower. They, they are constantly moving towards some direction. And this is what happens here as well with this critical, this winding, these energy bands with winding number, non-zero winding number. And the, veloc the, the average velocity is the winding number. So in this case is one, but you could have two, okay? You could do, um, okay, this, um, this band has, oh. Can I, yeah. can I ask? Sure, sure. Uh, so, um, 
what if so I guess that the setting is that you have like uh, let's say free Hamiltonian that is translational invariant on uh, like one D uh, is that sort of um, it's, let's say on a you have periodic boundary condition yes, yes. then sites have some local they might have some internal degrees of freedom on the top of everything is yes that... yes yes so you okay. to have more than one band to sorry yeah exactly that's more, why yeah yeah to have uh, many bands so we are we are doing the general case yeah in the general case um so maybe i should specify this Th thanks for this question sorry um so if you diagonalize this um this QCA or, or this Hamiltonian and these symbols just mean spatial locations, then you will just get one energy band, okay? However, we are solving here the general problem. The general problem is when you have, you in general, you can have uh, any number of modes in every location, every number of fermionic modes in every location. So, you, so then the, the creation and annihilation operators will have two, in, two labels one for the spatial location and the other for the internal degree of freedom. And then, yeah, the more, the larger is the internal degree of freedom, the, the more energy bands you have, okay? And like what, what you mean sort of technic, uh, uh, let's say technically when you say that, uh, let's say quasi particle travels with, let's say units. Like, yeah, I mean that like the, the, so for instance, yeah, so, um, okay, now let's imagine that um, um, yeah, you have, instead of J, you have uh, position X and internal degree of freedom L, okay? So then um, every, so you, there will be a linear combination of the L operators that uh, specify a creation operator of each quasi particle. So this is basically the eigen mode, the eigen mode associated to the energy band. And um, so, yeah, I don't know. So what happens is that the, there is a, so at, at every time step, at every time step, the, the these operators gain a, a constant phase, a unit phase, which is, associated to the shift, okay? Um, so it's, it's difficult to say because um, let's say that, in, for instance, maybe that, that will be clear. Uh, so I, I actually don't know how to express this in an easy way. If you have an energy band with winding number, but it's completely straight, okay? Let's suppose this one, okay? Then what we'll have here is that the, um, fermionic operators associated, associated to this quasi-particle, they will just keep rotating, okay? At constant speed, okay? That's very simple. Now, in general, you will have uh, something that doesn't need to be straight, can be uh, whatever, okay? So then you will have some, some strange dynamics, some contractions and uh, separations of the fermionic operators, but on average, they will all keep rotating. Yeah, that's, I don't know. Thanks, thanks, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not being very formal, but um, yeah, I don't know how to say it. Um, okay, so our con conclusion at the end is that when the QCA is one dimensional and quasi free, then they have, uh, in some sense, local Hamiltonian, okay? Now let us analyze another family of simple QCAs. Okay, these are Clifford QCAs. Clifford QCAs are those where the unitary uh, is Clifford. Clifford means that it maps um, it maps Pauli operators into Pauli operators, or if you want tensor products of Pauli operators into tensor products of Pauli operators. Okay, so sigma z at location r. So in this case, um, every site is a qubit for this example that I'm showing. Um, Sigma Z is mapped to Sigma X and Sigma X is mapped to Sigma Y in the same location and in the neighboring locations, Sigma X, okay? And you could ask, okay, once I know this, 
uh, because it's translational invariant, this is independent of the location R, okay? So I know how to how sigma z gets transformed everywhere and sigma x gets transformed everywhere. Now you could ask, and what about sigma y? Well, that's straightforward because I just need to multiply these expressions. I can multiply this times this. So this will cancel with this. And the two sigmas will multiply and I will get something proportional to sigma i. And I will get something, whatever is here, which will be the map, the, the future of sigma i, okay? So we see here that, um, yeah, so with, with just these conditions, we completely specify the dynamics W, okay? That's because it's Clifford and transitional invariant. Okay, and when you have Clifford dynamics, you can plot the evolution of operators in the Heisenberg picture very easy. As I said before, this diagram is, um, so yellow, I don't remember, but it starts with yellow. Yellow is, uh, yeah, yellow is, I think, sigma x. And blue and red, so, so red is um, sigma y, and blue is sigma z, okay? So this is the dynamics along, across a long time evolution of sigma x and how it evolves in time, okay? Now, so this simple rule, gives you this beautiful pattern. And now you understand why it's, people call it fractal QCA, okay? Well, the, the majority of Clifford QCAs are fractal actually, but not all of them. Um, okay, so yeah, this is how we analyze evolution. And again, we, we have the same question. Um, okay, so we have this W, which is completely specified by these conditions. And we want to find uh, Hamiltonians that generate this unitary. And each of these Hamiltonians can be written in the Pauli basic. So these P's are strings of Pauli's, okay? Tensor products of Pauli's in different locations, all of them, all possibilities of identity, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z everywhere, okay? So because the Pauli's form an orthonormal basis uh, or orthogonal basis, this is the, uh, we can always do that, okay? And the question that we ask is, is one of such Hamiltonians such that these coefficients are such that the interactions are in some sense local? Okay, so that's the question. Um, and we can prove that forever in, in this, for this W, okay, for any Pauli operator in one interval, okay, for instance, take, take one interval like this, A, B, there is another Pauli operator in a larger interval, the operator is P prime, which is not supported in any smaller interval, okay? And such that they have the same coefficient. Okay, the proof of this is actually quite simple because, um, you know, if you have a, give, give me any, any P, okay? And you can always calculate the future of P, okay? At every time step, um, you, you calculate the evolution of P. And um, so yeah, this is again, the same equations. Now I change the notation, sorry. This is my um, strings of Pauli operators. Okay, so U specifies in each location, whether it's identity, sigma X, sigma Y, sigma Z in every qubit, okay? And you can, because the Hamiltonian is invariant under so this equation tells you that the Hamiltonian is invariant under W. This implies that, um, that you can write it in this way, okay? So all, all terms, so all terms that are, for instance, if I take one of these strings, imagine it's this one, all the, of, all the future versions of this string also need to be in the, in the expression of the Hamiltonian because the Hamiltonian doesn't change if I apply W, okay? So it, it, can, it can do that, okay? So if, if, if you say, okay, this Hamiltonian has some local, I, I want it to be local. So it will have some, some local expression, but this local expression will, once I write this, will grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And it has still the same coefficient. So it means that for every, you, you can find a small operator, yeah, 
that's fine. So your Hamiltonian maybe have some quasi-local operators, but with some coefficient. But this implies that it will also have unboundedly large operators with the same coefficient. Okay, this is why it's the, the correlations do not decay in the, the interactions do not decay in any sense. It's not that they decay very slowly, it's that they just not decay at all. So um, this is quite nice. So this answers our question. Okay. Our question was uh, does causality imply um, local interactions? And with this counterexample, we see that it doesn't. Okay. Now you can say, well, how is so intuitively? I expect that if a dynamics is caus uh, caus uh, causal, uh, there should be some sort of locality because that, that's what it means causal, right? That things grow locally, that, that this has an non-identity operator because in the previous time step, here there was an non-identity operator, okay? And here there is nothing. But Clifford's, Clifford unitaries are, are, are a bit funny, okay? So if we take this Hamiltonian, Imagine, imagine that we start with sigma x, okay? And I apply one of these Hamiltonians, any that you choose, any that give me w, this w. Now, this Hamiltonian, uh, as, as soon as it starts the evolution, will generate a completely non-local operator everywhere. Uh, and time goes on, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. And when time reaches the first integer, one, all these non-local terms will cancel. There will be a, um, somehow a negative interference, okay? And they will all cancel. And we'll you will just get the, the second term here. So at, what happens with these Hamiltonians is that at non-integer times, non-integer times, they are completely non-local. But somehow it's a funny type of non-locality such that at integer times, all these cancels and you get inside the light cone. And here, this light cone only represents integer times because we are at discrete, discrete time, okay? Make sense, this? To me, it makes. Me too. Okay, <laughs> thank Just you. a question, question. So like in between, I guess like your, uh, your, your unitaries are not uh, Clifford gates anymore, right? This is something crazy. Like in, in exactly, for, exactly, yeah, exactly. Good point. And you yeah. kind of move back to the sub, small sub. Okay, right, nice. Yeah, nice. that's another way to say it. If you have a Clifford unitary and you find any Hamiltonian and you exponentiate it to a not a non integer um, value of time, you no longer have a, a Clifford. Okay. Yeah, or a Clifford to a non integral power. Is also non Clifford or some, some are like this. Okay, so we answer the question of the title of the talk. So, can I, can I have, Luis, can I have yes. a question? So, can you go back to the previous slide? So, I guess that the problem with like finding, I mean, the possibility of finding local Hamiltonian in this case comes from the second line of the definition of, of W, no? Yeah. I so, yeah, you're right. But I, I mean, this is just an example of this fractal Clifford QCA, but there are other Clifford QCAs, I guess, for which. Yeah, there are QCAs and um, so the non-fractal ones, mm -hmm. um, they, I, I, I don't have analyzed with care, but I believe that the non-fractal ones will have um, maybe a local Hamiltonian, okay? Because the non-fractal ones have, are, are based in gliders. The non-fractal ones have some evolution that goes to the right, but not, not in the two. It just, I, I don't know if, if you're familiar with, with classical cellular automata, they are called gliders. It's just like a particle. Maybe it's a big particle, but it just moves like this. Okay. It doesn't grow. Yeah, good. Okay, so I don't have much time, but uh, so I probably will not. Ah, okay, let me just before going to um, this order, say these last things. Okay, so the results that we have proven here for um, this, this theorem, okay, uh, not only apply to the Hamiltonian, but to any constant of motion, okay? Any constant of motion that, um, 
yeah, this is a constant of motion, something that commutes with the evolution operator. Uh, you have the same, the same result also applies with constants of motion because, um, you know, you can, again, do this argument, okay? For anything that commutes with W. And so then we find something that perhaps is interesting. I'm, I'm not expert in the theory of quantum integrability and quantum chaos, but here we have um, this, this example, this fractal Clifford QCA, um, can be described in phase space in the sense that I can describe the dynamics in terms of Pauli's. This is like a, the phase space of quasi-free fermions or quasi-free bosons, okay? So, and the phase space is linear in the size of the system. And you can, you can simulate the dynamics of the Clifford QCA in the phase space, which implies multiplying matrices that are linear in the size of the system. You don't need to do the simulation in the Hilbert space, which involves matrices that are exponential in the size of the system. So it's efficient to describe and to simulate this system if we use the phase space representation, which everybody does with Clifford, that's the point, right? Uh, it's the same that with fermions and with bosons. But uh, so in, some, in this sense, it seems integrable or that it shares something important with integrable systems, but it, it does not have constants of motions that are local in any sense, okay? They are totally non-local. Now, does this challenge a standard definition of integrability, which is in terms of constant, uh, local integrals, constants of motion? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I just put this question I, out there, okay? And if there is not any other question, I'm going to move to... Um, QCH with disorder. Okay, so this is again what I said before. We are not considering uh, what people call random circuits. We just want um, things like this. We could call them uh, time periodic quantum circuits or time periodic random circuits, okay? Because they are random in space. But we are to have a more rich model, we are going to consider this. Um, system. Now what I have is I have replaced every qubit, every qubit I have replaced by n qubits. So there are L sites and every L site has n qubits, okay? Just to make it more rich. Now uh, we are going to consider a cliff for QCA, which means that um, if I start with a sigma x, it will evolve and it will always be a product of, of Pauli sigmas, okay? and as my notation is that where there is nothing, it means that there is the identity and the rest is here. This is just an example. And because the, the first layer of gates, the first layer is chosen at random, it means that this string of Paulis is in some sense random, okay? Uh, but now we want to mathematically articulate how much random, okay? And um, so we go, to the model where I said before. So this was just, um, sorry. No. This was just a, a toy example just to write the Pauli sigmas, but the, model, the real model we consider is this, where um, every site has n qubits. Uh, so maybe this is sigma x in the first of these n qubits. And at the end, we just have a, a Pauli string. This is bold phase and with this U notation. So this means a random Pauli string. Okay, and um, yeah, so I, I want to ask myself, how random is this power? When, when I sample these unitaries at random, when I sample these unitaries at random, uh, just one layer, uh, how random is this string? And the answer is that in the limit of large N, it's approximately uniform overall Pauli strings, okay? More precisely is that, of course, it's only uniform within the light cone, okay? If, it, if the string of, uni of sigmas has not reached the, the end of the system, or maybe your system is in, it can only be uh, random inside the light cone because outside is the identity all the time, okay? So I'm comparing this, the pro this is the probability at time t, so T in this example would be one, two, three, and four time steps. 
And this is the probability distribution of the end condition on the initial state, whatever you choose, okay? And I'm comparing this, I'm, com I'm calculating the statistical distance with the uniform distribution inside the light cone. So only here, okay, in this case. Well, in this case, is this represents to be a periodic boundary conditions. And in this case, after four time steps, the system has reached, the, the, the operator has reached the whole system in this example, right? So then this would be the uniform distribution over all powers. And yeah, uh, this gives a, a useful bound for large n. So when this inequality holds, okay? Um, uh, sorry, can I ask? Okay, it's, sure. it's actually super interesting, like all that you think. Just uh, so that the n is the number of like internal qubits, so to say. Yes. I see. So you basically because of like uh, locality like the width of like the light cone would have a size of order t mm -hmm. right okay so so this sort of work provided uh yeah n is the logarithm of l it's larger than the logarithm okay. of l i see so it's kind of in a sense like if i think of this n or like or as like two to the n as like a local dimension then Basically, local dimension has to be much larger than uh, the size, the, the linear size. Yeah, I see. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, so it's it's kind of on a high level, it's similar to those maybe results on random quant. Okay, on random quantum circuits of like uh, Nick Hunter Jones. Is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Okay. So this is yeah. So this gives a bad bound. This is a bad bound. Because what we have in mind is what people call random circuits, okay? But with random circuits, things get more random as time goes on, okay? But here, things get less random as time goes on because this T increases and makes this uh, a worse bound, okay? Why is this the case? Well, it's the case because we are applying again and again the same unitary. So we start with a fixed operator. This unitary is chosen at random. So the output here is random. Now, we apply a random input to some random unitaries. So the output here is even more random. But now we are applying random unitaries, but they are random, but not independent of the input because this input depends on the orange unitary. And here is the orange unitary again. So that's the problematic thing. For, ex for instance, let me choose one example. Let's suppose that there is only this orange unitary. Let's forget all the others. All the others are the identity. Now, this orange unitary is a Clifford unitary, and there are finitely many Clifford unitaries. So this orange unitary, when I multiply it by itself, it will generate a one parameter group, and it's finite. So eventually it goes back to the identity. So eventually this, uh, no matter which random, so let's suppose that the order of this one parameter group is 222, okay? So no matter what random unitary I choose here, the output will be the same of the input. So not random at all, okay? So this was just an extreme example, but yeah, so things get less random when the input is correlated with the dynamics, okay? And also it makes it extremely hard to analyze, okay? So this is why people have not worked too much with time periodic random circuits, okay? They make a lot of sense from the point of view of uh, many body physics, but uh, yeah, they are very hard to analyze in general. Okay, there are some results out there. Okay, but yeah, for small times or large n, we, we have that is close to uniform. Uh, also something that I can say is that across the diagonal, across the light, the, the edge of the light cone, every unitary is new. So the purple has not appeared before. The deep blue has not appeared before, okay? So if you continue here uh, in the, let me write it. In this sequence of information, the every unitary is, the input is always decorrelated with the output. Sorry, the input is always decorrelated with the, uncorrelated with the dynamics, uh, statistically independent, okay? Because the, the history of this input when arrives here, has not seen the deep blue, and here has not seen black, okay? 
you see the black is here, but the input has not seen this black, okay? Makes sense. When I arrive here, there is a yellow here, okay? But the, this input has not seen the yellow. So it's when it gets into the yellow, it's statistically independent of the yellow. So the diagonal is very easy to analyze. It's exactly like random circuits, actually. And then um, the mathematical trick that we use is to do something like this. We see that this is random. And if you want, we want to see the randomness here, we, see the, we, we, we find the rank of this matrix on average. And this output here is close to uniform. And then this will be close to uniform. Sorry if I'm not explaining very well. I'm just trying to get a bit of the intuition of how we prove this result. So we just found the, the rank of, of a, a product of diagonals, how the, a bound that it, with high probability is, is not small, okay, this, this rank. So this means that um, what comes here is completely independent than, than these matrices, okay? No, sorry, um, yeah. Is independent of these matrices and oh no, not really. We have to do here. Yeah, it's independent of these matrices because this one only appears once. Yeah, that's that's the key point of the proof that the elbow of this shape only appears one. So it erases all the correlations. The, the output here, let me change the color. The output here is not correlated with the brown because the purple has erased all the correlations, okay? So that's the idea of the proof, okay? Luis, can I have a question? Yes. So, well, I guess it's a stupid question, but I missed something about this, this bound that you, that you have on the slide. So it seems that if you increase L, the, the distribution becomes more random. Yeah. But so if I... Put one, which is just one like layer on this circuit. No. Yeah. It's the distribution is uh, is becomes. I mean, if I increase n, it becomes uniform. But yeah. at yeah. the same time, the the input of the circuit is is not uniform. No. No, but the unitaries are uniform. Actually, no matter no matter how. Yeah, exactly. No but the unitaries act only on on like some some uh, qubits. No, not not all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, but uh, we compare we compare the the out. So imagine that. P is here, okay, the one you're interested. Mm -hmm. So this P, we compare it with the uniform distribution inside the light cone. The light uh, cone okay. means this. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah, otherwise it's trivially false, okay? Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, this is just, uh, well, just another, another result. With, with this result, you can prove another theorem with this theorem, that it says that um, time periodic random Clifford circuits, like the ones I've shown here, form a true design in, it's not really a true design, so I put it in quotation marks. Uh, why is not that? Because I call it a true design, but imagine that true designs is about distinguishing a given ensemble of unitaries from the, all the unitaries, okay, from the hard measure. And um, if you, but, and, and you can distinguish this, you are given one of these two options and you have to guess which one is, okay? And if you cannot distinguish, then it's a true design, okay? Now, um, here in this distinguishing process, we are restricted to only Pauli measurements. If we are restricted to Pauli measurements, this, uh, this unitary cannot be distinguished from a hard unitary. Well, up to some some bounds, okay. So yeah, and maybe it's not. I mean, I should not call it a true design, okay, because it's not the same thing. But it it gives the idea. Uh, okay, now I don't have much time to go to this order, but basically it's the same. It's the same model. I hear they have a different picture, but it's the same that we were using before. It's just that now we have the the um, numbers, every gate has a number in addition to a color. These are my um, qubits. Now, well, you can have this to be a single qubit or in qubits, okay? And this is a time step, 
okay, behind steps. And every, in the phase space representation, every, um, every one of these unitaries in the in phase space can be written as a symplectic matrix. You will know that if you're familiar with Clifford unitaries. And the nice thing about the phase space is that what in the Hilbert space is a tensor product of spaces, in phase space is the linear sum, okay? So let's suppose that this represents this unitary, okay? This is the symplectic representation of this unitary. So A is the transformation, the local transformation on the first qubit. D is the local transformation on the second qubit. Uh, C is the map of in the information that flows from the first qubit to the second. And B is the information that flows from the second to the first. Okay, you can understand this. So now you can analyze situations, okay? How information flow. Imagine, imagine that you want, sorry, imagine that you, you want to find one of these uh, one directed walls, okay? So one, one sided walls, okay? So what is the mathematical condition on the, on, on these unitaries, okay, to have a, a one-sided wall. And here we write this condition. So um, for every input, it has to be zero. So we arrive at this, but this, this is one single time step and a wall exists for all time steps. So in, after two time steps, you also want this to be zero. Sorry, I'm not explaining this very slow because I don't have time. And, and yeah, uh, the general condition. Rush. No worries. Okay, yeah. thank you. The general condition is this one, okay? This means that the, at every time step, information cannot flow to the right. Okay, so you can see here, the, here you have in the left an instance of one time step, two time steps, and you always put that the output for whatever is the input vector, in phase space, the output is zero. This is only possible if this product of unitary is zero. And T is the number of time steps, okay? Now you can, for instance, uh, when N is one, you can find the probability. So now you generate um, two, two consecutive uh, uh, unitaries, okay? Like this, sorry, this and this. Now, what, and I choose them at random with uniform distribution over the Clifford group. What is the probability that um, they satisfy the condition? Okay, this, condi this is a joint condition of the two unitaries for all t. For each t, you have a, it has to be zero for all t. Now, for, if you're in the case n equals one, the probability that this holds is this number, okay? So, you know, it means that on average, every nine qubits, you will have a wall, okay? Because it's on average, okay? This, this is the probability for a wall to appear. Okay, so this, these walls happen. However, if as you increase N, the bigger is N, the smaller is the probability. It goes actually, it, it decreases super, expon super exponentially with N. So, yeah. So if N is large, you don't expect to observe localization. So this is how we have this, the, this is why these two results are compatible. We have a result on mixing and a result on localization. It's the same model. So how mixing is the, the opposite of localization. The, both things cannot happen, but one thing uh, presumes um, this condition and the other model uh, assumes the opposite condition, okay? Okay. And but also then like for n equal to one, uh, la, uh, let's say random uh, Clifford uh, quantum theory automata will not uh, form fract fractals, just would localize. Uh, yeah, you will have, you, you will have this, uh, for instance, here I mean, for, n, for n equal to one, you you just have uh, localization, not no. Fractions. Well, th that depends on the time scale. That depends on the time scale. If uh, so, 
for, for very small times, there is no difference between localization and mixing. Okay, here is the same. You, you just need to wait until you find a wall. Okay. So this is what it, it's, a, it's a relation between N and time. Make sense? Sure, sure. I was I was just con con contrasting those beautiful fractals, which I guess they're like I know that, sorry, sorry, infinite yeah. time. And, yeah. Yeah. The sure, fractal no, is transistor invariant. It doesn't have this order. Yeah, sure, sure. But, okay. Uh, thanks. Okay. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah, very nice result. Yeah. So now let me just conclude. Uh, well, in two dimensions, it turns out that there is no localization. You can make a generalization of this model in two dimensions, and there is no localization. And then uh, I, I just wanted to finish with this table. And this table uh, says that uh, Clifford dynamics is when you compare it with quasi free fermions or quasi free bosons, and you compare it with generic quantum systems, it's, it's kind of weird, okay? Because it has some properties of each, okay? For instance, uh, there is um, localization in one, in, one, um, in one dimension, okay? But there is not localization in two dimensions, like the generic case. It satisfies eigenstate thermalization, unlike the quasi-free systems. It does not have local integrals of motion, it can generate unitary designs of order three, while quasi-free systems have order zero. And it has a phase space description like quasi-free systems. So you see that in some of these properties, it's like um, quasi-free, and in some of these properties, a generic system. OK, here I wrote weak, but it can be either weak or, or no localization at all. OK, so this is all what I want to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so Luis, thank you for this nice presentation. Uh, so, are there any questions? There, there were many questions during your talk, but maybe someone else would like to ask something. Okay, so can you could you explain what is the difference between a strong localization and super strong localization? Yeah, uh, strong localization. So here, this is what I mean by um, what people call Anderson localization. Okay, and it means that you have the, the, the operators grow and eventually they stop, but they stop with an exponentially decaying tail. Okay. okay. In our case, I call it super strong because it's the same thing, but there is not even the tail. It just finishes abruptly the, the light cone. And in generic systems, if they have localization, which usually they don't, what you have is the, there is the, the light cone never stops. It just grows very slowly. Okay. And can you also maybe say uh, why in the 2D case there is no localization in the Clifford case? Um, yeah, so we proof this proof is with um, how you call it percolation theory. Okay. And, and basically, um, you know, because it can grow in all dimensions. So in the, the idea is that in one dimension, uh, you have you have this event, okay? If this event holds, there is a wall. Now, um, maybe this, the probability is very small for this wall, but if your spin chain is infinite, eventually you will have one, right? So uh, there is always localization if the spin chain is infinite. However, because it only needs to have a wall in one place. On the contrary, in, in, in this situation, as time goes on, the wall okay. needs to be every time bigger mm -hmm. if there is a wall, okay? And this becomes very, very, very unlikely. So it could happen that some instances have localization at some places, but is, is an atypical situation. Okay, thank you. So any other question? Can I, uh, Mick? Of course. So I wanted, so, okay, I, can you move, move back to the table? I, I didn't catch one thing about prefermions. Uh, the title? 
no, no, uh, to the table, 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 table the, the summary of the results or comparison of, of different models. Because like, okay, uh, you said that uh, free, uh, like you don't get uh, one uh, sort of one designs with quasi free fermions, uh, sorry, that you cannot have unitary K design with quasi free. Uh, but in a sense, I guess you can get get around with K equal one when you care yeah. about. Yeah, in a subspace, okay. so you mean? Yeah, okay, when you, do, okay, depends what. So you yes. have the particle number that sure, com sure commutes, but yeah, in, a, in the space of particularly conserved, or when you or have parity conserve. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, you could, okay, you could just, have a one uh, design. Yes. Yeah, just, okay, so just say. Okay, but still, just, there is a difference between one and, and three. Of course, of course, sure, sure, sure. Uh, and uh, no, no, okay, maybe more serious question. So, I, so, so this model of quantum Sarah, Sarah automata, like, is like very interesting. Like, you know, some people are interested in, in let's say, com like behavior of complexity, uh, you know, yes. uh, like in some mo models of interacting dynamics. So, mm -hmm. uh, I understand that, like, Okay, with with three folds, of course, you there is no chance. Like, if you have uh, several automaton based on three folds, like you you have always bounded complexity because just three fold gates can be just realized with polynomial yeah. circuit. But like, uh, do you think like what what? Okay, is it like did people study or do you think it's feasible to study? Uh, let's say. Uh, complexity when you have those uh, the, the, this disorder but for let's say generic two qubit gates something like this like okay people study complexity in the case of random circuits that it is not the circuit is sure. not time periodic if you yes. make it time periodic it's extremely hard it's mm -hmm. maybe it's possible but uh, no one has done any there is no result in the direction yet mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right it's, just, it's similar to studying the complexity of the evolution with a local Hamiltonian. Take a spin chain, take a local Hamiltonian, and tell me what is the depth of the circuit after some time, okay? Sure. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need necessarily to grow with time because, you know. Of course, of course. I mean, uh, it's general, generically, so, so you think it's mathematically, so, okay, but you have uh, this, this frozen, uh, like disorder, right? So maybe this can help some, uh, maybe. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, yeah, but maybe, yes. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting model and uh, yeah, very nice result. I, I, uh, thank you, thank I you for that. everything. Okay, so I think that since there are no other questions, well, uh, I guess we can finish. So let's thank Good. you again and uh, thank, see you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for everything. See you next time. See you next time.